My name is Lauren Zelka Pele. I teach materials and texturing. Whether you are looking to plus your models or become a look development artist yourself, I teach the process of working in Substance Painter to Maya to get those beautiful renders that are gonna make your reel look amazing. My journey has been kind of a long one. I've done a lot of different things. I started out in VFX feature and then I quickly transitioned to gaming. I shipped three titles. Then I moved on, I got an offer to go to Nickelodeon and I took it. It happened to come on the same day that we shipped our last title and the timing was just perfect. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do this. So I jumped over to animation and I worked at Nickelodeon for quite a few years, moved on to DreamWorks, was at DreamWorks for nearly seven years, worked on tons of different shows, had a lot of different opportunities there. And then when another opportunity came my way to switch to VFX episodic, I took it. And it's been an interesting and um, exciting process. I'm always learning something. Usually I decide to go where I'm going to learn the most. For art school, I went to Noman School of Visual Effects, which was a very challenging time in my life. It was the hardest two years of my life, but I worked really, really hard as any student in VFX or CG knows, it takes a lot of work and a lot of dedication and nobody's gonna hand it to you. You're going to get out of it what you put in it. And so I, that was my mantra when I was in school is I've got to make this work. Um, and so I really did enjoy my time there. I found it very inspiring to find a bunch of like-minded individuals. I felt like before going there, I really didn't find anybody like myself. Um, so having all of these people surrounding me that were interested in the same things, that were ready to work hard, that were excited by animation and VFX, it was very, uh, a very exciting time in my life, although it was, as I said, very hard because of the amount of work that it takes. Um, the great thing about going in, in person was that I had access to a lab where I could when projects were at a point where I could render out my frames, anybody who's done any rendering knows it can take a lot of time. And so to be able to take over multiple machines was really helpful. But the number of times that I was actually in that position of actually needing that many machines wasn't that often. And most of the time, I lost a lot of time driving to and from school. Um, there was a time where I commuted all the way from San Diego up to Noman, which is a pretty far drive. That's over two hours. Um, and I eventually had to move just because of that, because I was losing time and it's precious when you're getting to the point of you're, end, you're finishing your term, you're trying to get your projects done, you've got finals, you've got your reel, the ever pressing need to finish your reel, Though that time really matters. And so um, I find that working in Anim School and the ability to seamlessly transition from class time to work time. And sometimes depending on the class, you might even be able to do both at the same time. <laughs> um, and because we also record everything that makes it, we're able to go back and rewatch anything that may have gaps. So I think that I would have really benefited from that situation because I spent so much extra time lost in transit um, so much extra time transferring files. That takes a lot of time, like putting it on a hard drive and moving it back over to school and then bringing it back to my machine at home to continue my project. You run into problems of the possibility of continuity. Do I have the same file here as I do at school and so on and so forth. Um, so there definitely are benefits from being able to log into your class, show up for your appointed time, and then you're still, you don't lose any time while you switch back over to work on your projects. I'm very inspired by the artist Mary Blair. Um, I know that she's one of the pioneers in our industry that um, her artistic input was valued at a time when women were disregarded. Um, if they even worked in the industry at all, they were maybe only allowed to work in ink and paint. Um, and so this was a person that was recognized as having great ideas, given some authority and, you know, even had some directorial work. And, um, you know, that's at a time where it was very, very difficult for a woman to be regarded as anything other than just a seat filler. Um, so in terms of 
an artist from the past that inspires me, it would be Mary Blair. But somebody that inspires me from today would be the women in leadership. Um, at my current studio, I work at Fuse Effects. The head of my studio is Lindsay Kaiser, and she's an incredible person. And she is um, always, it's amazing how busy she is, and yet she is so down to earth, ready to talk to you, um, ready to give guidance in careers. Um, and she's just been an immense source for me to go to um, and my career path. And then uh, there's other women in VFX, women like Allison Mann, who has worked um, at a lot of different studios. Primarily, she started out in recruiting and has leveled up from there. And she works on inclusion. She works with the Brick Foundation and they work on education and empowerment. And so it's these women that are pushing our industry forward, women that work with women in animation, um, that really, it makes it not really be about our gender. It's working in the industry is not about our gender, it's about our work. And that's the wonderful thing about this is that we can all focus on the work and not how we were born or how we identify. I feel like when I was in school, there was the misconception that it was either going to be really, really easy for you because you were a girl or the opposite. It was going to be really, really hard. Um, and because I, I don't know why there was that misconception, but I feel like as we have moved forward in this industry, it's been leveled out a lot. There's not those extreme peaks and valleys of either easy or hard. It's it's, it's hard for all of us. It takes hard work for every single person. I definitely love writing. Um, I spend a lot of my free time writing and have several books out in the world. I feel that being a story storyteller is important for the visual artists in us, for us look development artists, for us modelers, for us riggers, whatever visual story we're telling that can also translate to the page. So as a visual storyteller, we're not using any words, but I love to explore being able to paint the picture of an entire environment. What does the character see when they walk out on that viewpoint? Um, what does it feel like? What is that person's life like? As visual artists, we get to tell that story, the history of the object, what happened to this um, artifact before we even saw it in frame. So it's really, it's taking it a step further than that and fleshing out the entire environment. As production artists, we spend a lot of our time working on somebody else's ideas. It's really, really fantastic to be a part of a team, to be in this collaborative group effort where you're all working together to make that final shot, make that bomb drop moment where everything coalesces, the music, the dialogue, the images that you worked on to make it all come together. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's also somebody else's project, somebody else's idea that you have contributed to. So I really like to encourage students or anyone that likes to work in a visual medium to explore as much as you can and have your personal projects because they will keep you fresh. They will keep your ideas coming when you are working in a group environment where you're working on a production. It will help inspire those ideas and contribute to that project that you're working on in a project production. It'll help your own personal projects. Everything gets better when you continue to push yourself outside of your working hours. Well, I, I do really like to impress that upon my students because that's what I do at work. Even though I do write at home on my free time, you know, writing sci-fi and fantasy, I do story at work. When I'm in a big meeting with, you know, the director or production, or it, it could be depending on the what's going on on that certain day, we are continually talking about story. So even though I'm working on asset development, a lot of times I'm doing problem solving. I always like to joke that my job is like 85% problem solving, fixing the shot. Why is nothing working? Well, a big part of my job is also storytelling and they will ask, well, what's the story on this here? They wanna know what was the thought process in how you made this, even though we're working on an asset level sometimes, or it could be a shot level, story is still present regardless of what we're working on. Well, I think, I think I've learned this a lot more as I've gone forward in my career, and it was talked about in school, but I think that it didn't really sink in or maybe it wasn't talked about it enough. 
but it's the process of note taking. And, and yes, I do also mean writing down notes, you know, keeping track of everything in a notebook. I always recommend that. That's one of my pieces of business advice. Take notes. You want to be able to refer back to that. You don't want to forget anything. If your art director told you, hey, I'd like you to fix this, write it down. You're probably going to forget. But the note taking process, I think that that didn't really sink in for me too much. And it took a lot of years in production to understand that it was a big part of my job. My job was the note sometimes. It didn't really matter how I felt about something. I was making something for a production. So it needed to serve the story point, whatever we were trying to do for that particular episode or that particular shot. I had to serve the needs of the show. And that's something that I also teach is needs of the show. You need to keep that in mind because that's the most important thing is taking the note. Your note comes from your art director or your um, executive producer, whoever it comes from. It's very important not to argue the note, to listen, to try and take a step back from your work, not be married to your work and say, okay, what can I do to give them what they're looking for? The more that you can step back and absorb those notes well, not fight their notes, not um, explain your thought process on them, but to just deliver what they want, the more successful you're actually gonna be because they're gonna see you as somebody who listens, somebody who does what's needed for the production, and you'll get picked up for that next show, hopefully. They'll think of you the next time something else is coming up and go, that person was really easy to work with. They listened really well. That many times has, I think, gotten me that extension on the contract that next show that next pickup because sometimes it's actually not necessarily about being the best best artist it's about being a good artist but it's also about listening i think it would be pipeline so i was used to working on my own projects on my own machine i save files wherever i wanted name them whatever i wanted uh, when i'd get mad at my files if they weren't cooperating i would maybe name them a not so nice word and then that would <laughs> become a part of the project accidentally um, stuff like that you really cannot do in a production you have to use naming conventions you have to save in specific locations um, saving things outside of pipeline can actually break tools. So that was a learning process for me of, okay, I need to do what I do, but I needed to do it within their format. I need to do it on their timeline. Cause that's the other thing is that when we're working on our personal projects, we're setting our own timelines. We may have the framework of a class final project needs to be fin finished by week 10, 11, that sort of thing. But other than that, timelines are fairly loose in general. And that is a big learning factor of learning. I have to have something to show on this day. It is due on X day. That sort of um, scheduling factor is something that takes some time to learn as well. Yeah, like if you're working in Photoshop, you name your layers. If you're in Substance Painter, also name your layers or at least name your folders. But it's not critical. You'll work with people that you open their file and you just go, Oh my gosh, what is this catastrophe? Um, nobody's most of the time checking their work, but if you become the person that you're really organized, anytime they get something from you, they're gonna go, oh wow, I got a file from so-and-so. That's I know it's gonna be easy to work with. Like there's gonna be a sense of relief when they get something from you because they start to build up that trust of this person has done everything to set up the file so that it's easy for someone else to step in. I had a teacher when I was at school that um, he said something, it was kind of in a more ominous sense of like, what if you were gone tomorrow? Um, kind of a dark way to think of it, but it did actually really make an impression on me. He said, you should always set up your files as if you were gonna be gone tomorrow. You could be gone from the studio. It might not be so bad. You might've gotten a different job, but somebody else might have to jump into your file in production. The file's got to move forward, even if you're not moving forward with a production. So always think about the next person that's got to work on that potential file just in case. Well, I think we're going to be moving towards 
um, sticking with a hybrid situation for probably the foreseeable future, there will be some studios that because they already have the large campus, um, they're going to be encouraging people to come back, at least in some small part. I know that several of the studios are already doing that where they have um, we'd like you to come in two to three days a week, but they're really flexible with it. And they're also offering, if you request, you can still work from home. Um, so I think that that's going to stick around. There's um, people with differing levels of comfort regarding working in person still. So they are trying to honor those um, those feelings. And, the, the, and then there's the factor of people are very, very, um, they're still able to get their work done. So at the end of the day, if it's done in the office or it's, if it's done at home, if the work is getting done and the work is optimal, then, you know, why not proceed forward as since it's going well? Um, there are people that are still contracting to be, um, to be work from home for the duration of their contract. That's certainly the case at my job. Um, currently, I do go into the office two days a week, but that's by choice. That's just because I want to and I like to go in and be seen and um, be there to those that I work with and those that are reporting to me so that I can answer their questions. Um, but it's a personal choice. If I wanted to, I could work from home all the time. So I think that it has proven to be effective and so therefore will be sticking around. I made this joke at work the other day because this question came up of what do you do um, to you know, get away from the computer? I said, I literally run away from the computer. I will go for a run in my neighborhood. I, I'm not the best runner. I, I don't even know if I actually like it, but I do it because I get exercise. Um, and it's something that I took up during uh, quarantine because if you can't go to the gym, um, that sort of thing. So just running outside prove to be one of the best things for me, I can quickly get some exercise and, and look elsewhere, you know, not look at a monitor right in front of me because it's really important to protect your eyes. Um, there was someone, a student that said there's a rule of like 20, 20, 20, every 20 minutes, you look 20 feet away, something like that. I should really actually know what that rule is, but something along those lines of give your eyes a break and look as far as you can and get your eyes to readjust. Um, we use our eyes every day for work. It's very important to keep them, keep them going strong. Well, I think I would like to get back into Unreal. I shipped three titles in Unreal and it has really made a comeback in a way that it's now present in many facets of production. And I'm actually working on a virtual production right now. And I'm thinking that this is a really exciting thing to be in. Um, it's so useful in many different ways. It's a different way of thinking. Um, the things that are taught in my class in terms of how we texture is really specific to Maya and rendering. And it's a different mindset for working within Unreal or some other game engine. So I'd like to, in the future, potentially transition to do more virtual production work. If you know where you're going, if you know I'm stopping by this booth and these people are gonna be there, try to look up who is working at the booth and get familiar with their work. Tell them something about, I love that one piece that you did. Um, you know, tell them what you liked about it. Try not to ask them for something specifically. Make it a positive introduction where you're not asking for something. Um, that I would say is a classic mistake of, I just met this person, can I have a job? Um, they're not gonna be in that position to be able to do that. And it's only gonna start off on the wrong foot. Make that positive first connection, get to know them a little bit and then move on find them on LinkedIn, send them a LinkedIn invite and say, I loved meeting you at Lightbox. It was great to talk to you, give them a small reminder of what you had said to them so that you had that positive interaction with them. Send them that LinkedIn connection, follow them on LinkedIn, keep track of what they're doing and start to build slowly with, with these people. Um, asking for too much too soon is probably what's gonna get you um, not what you're looking for. <laughs> That would be the Jurassic World Raptors. Um, that was a very long process and sometimes stressful. We went through a lot of iterations on them. There was a lot of questions of what should they look like? 
We did a lot of different tests of, you know, a more graphic style, um, what would happen if we made them hyper real. Um, and then when we finally landed on something that was then sent to Steven Spielberg for his approval. Now, they did not tell me that that was happening until after his approval, fortunately, because they know that I would have freaked out and I would have said, wait, wait, we should really work on this a little bit more. We should really, you know, just make sure. Um, but it was a very great test for me because I was working with so many different people. Um, I had to create something that executives liked, that my art director liked, that my executive producer liked, and then so, so much so that it had to then go higher to anybody that had a vested interest in the Jurassic World's franchise. So that was a really big challenge for me to, um, like I talked earlier about needs of the show and about stepping back, I had to take a lot of feedback all the time and be willing to go back to the drawing board from the beginning and rework things. And then in the end, when we got that positive result of this is what we're doing, I then got to design the look of all the dinosaurs going forward, which was very exciting. Or I got to be a part of designing the look, I should say. I was a part of a team, so it's not like it was just my project, but it was exciting to be a part of that. One thing that excites me is the availability that they have right at their fingertips to try anything and everything. Um, everything is a search away, which I try my hardest not to be like the old geezer teaching my class in terms of back in my day, we didn't have the search availability because really we didn't. Um, a lot of my, you know, my co my coworkers and my classmates are a lot of the people that created those tutorials that you can search out. So really what's exciting is the fact that anytime you're at a hands up moment where you go, I'm just not sure why this isn't working. You can search it and find, you can get yourself unstuck very quickly. Um, and I think that that's a really fantastic thing to be able to remove that stopper of, okay, I've got this one problem. The problems do not end. You know, they're the same, some of the same problems that I dealt with when I was starting out, some of the same problems that I deal with today of sometimes in CG, there's just some issue that we have to problem solve our way around. That doesn't change. But the fact is there's so much available that you can find to help you through that situation. And there's so many people, there's discord channels, there's forums, there's so many different resources of people that want to help. and this connectivity that I think was lacking before this interconnected world of people that want to help each other that are supportive of your work and you know you're able to show each other the things that you've done and have this worldwide ability to find someone on the other side of the world that is working on something similar and give them feedback and then they give you feedback. There's there's so many different examples where this is really a benefit to our industry. I would advise people to learn anything and everything that they can, because as a look dev artist, we are recreating the world around us. So look at the way that things are built. How is something constructed? This model, this matters on the model side, of course, so the model needs to support that also. But when you are recreating a material, look at the details. How shiny is something in real life? How bumpy is it? What is the scale of that texture? Because that's one thing that is, um, is something that takes some time to learn, to develop your eye in terms of what is the size of something. If you're trying to visually tell a story about an object, well, how big should the object feel? Should it feel like a little tiny figurine that's sitting on a shelf? Or is it a massive sculpture? The scale of the texture is going to visually tell the viewer what it is. So become observant of your surroundings. Think about how you might recreate something in CG in order to get that look. I teach all of the steps so that the final result can be arrived at much sooner with a lot less trial and error. I teach multiple ways of doing things. Um, anytime I'm teaching a certain process, I will show you one way that I've done it in my professional career, but then I'll show you another way. 
you might be working in this situation. And so this might be the way that you can achieve that result. I always show more than one way to arrive at a similar or same result, um, because depending on your working situation, you may not have access to the same tools. So I like to teach anything and everything in order to arrive at that final finished asset.